But after that book came out, people kept asking me what I knew about ayahuasca and addiction. I knew nothing. I never even heard about it. And they kept asking me. And I finally said, fuck off. I don't know anything about it. You know? <laughs> Until I said, well, maybe the universe is knocking on my door for a reason here. And then somebody told me there was an opportunity to do uh, uh, ceremonies locally, as there are opportunities to do that. And so I did. And the very first night that I experienced ayahuasca, I got it. I just got it. I just got why it could help people who are stressed, people with addictions, people, anybody. Just the way it opens you up, opens your heart, uh, gives you um, connection and insight. And so I then decided to start working with it. Um, but again, I don't lead the ceremonies. I'm not a shaman. I, I just help to prepare the, the participants for the ceremony and help them process and integrate their experience afterwards. So what I did is I added a... Uh, my therapeutic skills, however they may be, to the ceremonial process. So, and the ceremonial process is run by people, at least the people I work with, who are deeply steeped in the Shipubo, Peruvian, Amazon tradition. They chant in that language. Their teacher is uh, a Shipubo native Indian from Peru, who comes up here sometime, by the way. And I participated in ceremonies with him a few weeks ago along with one of my sons. And so that I just simply added what I knew to what they were already doing, but it's in a certain tradition that I, you know, that's being respected, and it's very respectful. Now, there are some people who lead ceremonies who will bring the ayahuasca and they'll put on CD music. No chanting, no interactive energetic work. Well, that's another way to do it, but the way I work with it is very much in a, with a, a respect for that tradition. Right. What well, we've added to that is, is the preparation mm -hmm. and the processing afterwards. Yeah. So people used to do ceremonies. Like in, the, in, in the Amazon, of course, it's a different situation. People are in the village. The shaman is known to them. In fact, for a long time, people didn't take the ayahuasca. Only the shaman did. And he would then read people and tell them what they needed for their healing. But there's a culture around it. Now here in the North and the West, first of all, we're much more psychologically complicated. Secondly, we don't have the cultural context for it. So we've attempted to do with these retreats to create some kind of at least a temporary context where people are not just going to a strange experience unprepared, but there's some processing before and of course intense processing afterwards. And um, that's what that along with what the plant does is what makes it so powerful. By the way, I should say not just what the plant does. It's not like go home and drink this and you'll be fine. It really is a context, a, a sacred context, and I can't emphasize it too much. Um, that, that the chanting that, that the shamans do, the, um, and the chanting is very specific. They don't just go through a, a playlist of songs they're going to sing that night. When they sing a particular song depends on what somebody else is going through. And they'll chant whatever is appropriate for them at that moment. Everybody else hears the chants and benefits from it. But it's very specific, so it's very spontaneous, and it's very direct, and it's very responsive to people's actual experience. And some chants will make you throw up, and other chants may give you more of a sense of peace. Um, so it's not like, like here's a drug that will do something for you. It really is a... A, a, a sacred um, thing that, if it's not honored, mm, I think people lose out a lot. We tell people all the time, this is not going to save your life. And, and in fact, you're, you're, um, the Buddha talked about our habit energies that are so powerful, it takes a lot to overcome them. And those habit energies are those ingrained patterns from childhood. And they're very, very powerful because they help you survive. You're so hard, it's so hard to get let go of them. So it takes conscious awareness and work to uh, maintain the connection to yourself in the face of those habit energies. Now, TJ gets on stage and he shares himself with, you know, dozens of people every night. And that's a very powerful way to do it. But, of course, not everybody who does a ceremony is going to do that. But we tell everybody, you've got to have some practice. 
Otherwise, it's just going to become a memory. And practice means daily doing something that somehow evokes something of that experience. Now, that might be meditation. It might be just 10 minutes of writing about what you experienced, even if you're doing it for the 100th time. But just putting yourself back into that state and connecting with what you saw there. If you don't do that, it does become a fading memory. As to your second question about do you have to believe in spirits, I don't. The shamans I work with, or, and by the way, they wouldn't call themselves shamans. They, they would say they're uh, ayahuascaros, they're, they're, they're learning. You know. But I, mean, I think they are shamans. But they, you know, they don't think of themselves that way. They think of a shaman as something much more wiser than they feel themselves to be. But um, they work with people, and they'll say, and I saw a devil standing over there. And I worked really hard to get rid of that devil. And I said, Dave, devil, what the fuck are you talking about? I mean, they see things in the dark. And by the way, they see things in the dark. I don't. They read people's energies in the dark. They know what somebody's going through from across the room. They're trained to be that sensitive during the ceremony. And sometimes they see angels, and sometimes they see devils, and they see spirits. And I don't. And so um, I always interpret those phenomena in psychological terms. But I'm quite willing to allow them their interpretation. So I don't have to accept or understand that maybe someday I'll see devils. I don't know. But um, if I do, I do. If I don't, I don't. But I also don't have to resist their particular experience. I don't have to argue about it. I don't have to dismiss it in my mind. I just... Okay, if that's how you see it, that's great, because it's certainly helping you help that person over there. So I don't think it takes that kind of belief to, to get benefit from these things. Do you have any uh, theory as to why it has a different effect on people, even though you're drinking the same tea, and why it's different you know, the next night than it was the night before? Uh, well, um, you weren't the same person the second night you did it as you were the first night. Um, you were not the same person. And um, as to why, everybody's brain is different. Everybody's life experience is different. Everybody's physiology is different. Everybody's metabolism is different in terms of how they metabolize the plant. And people are at different stages of their lives. So, I mean, why would they have the same experience? It'd be, you know, it, it, it'd be unusual if they did. But if we were all drinking whiskey, it wouldn't be quite so varied. Well, whiskey is, um, they call it a spirit, don't they? Um, <laughs> You know, people that work with alcohol and they have in a spiritual way, they might have it differently. But why do people drink whiskey? They don't do it to have a conscious, aware experience. They do it for just the opposite. So I think it depends on, too, on the intention and the context. Oh, sure. Ayahuasca is not the way to do it. There is no the way to do it. It's just one particular path. It's available to a relatively small number of people. Um, I do retreats without ayahuasca. Now, the experience will not be as intense, but I've seen a lot of transformational experiences. In fact, people even have had spiritual experiences sometimes, very rarely. But I, a friend of mine leads transformational enlightenment retreats where people come to similar realizations. So there's lots of ways to get there, and the plant is just one of them. There's nothing unique about that from that point of view. And it would be wrong to think that, you know, and, and actually, if people can get there without the plant, even so much the better, in a certain way. The, the ayahuasca is a, a very woody vine, vine, that uh, wraps itself around trees. So they chop it up, and as TJ said, they mix it with another plant, and they boil it together for, they chop up these, um, this, this vine, and they boil it with another plant called chapruna, and they boil it for about eight hours, and then you get this brew. And the shame is when they prepare it, they certainly chant over it. Yeah, uh, I, there's been no such studies, because, at least in North America, because you can't get approval for such studies, because ayahuasca is not one of these uh, quantifiable pharmaceutical agents that you can uh, put into a pill form and then run uh, study, double-blind studies on. 
It just does not fit into the Western medical model. There's no way to get approval for a study using ayahuasca. I talked to Health Canada about that. I could do it if I had $3 million. <laughs> so uh, the experience, the, only, the closest I can come to it is to tell you that in Brazil, where there's a, 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 a religious movement around ayahuasca called Santo Daime, they've studied those people. Psychiatrists have studied those people. And over time, there's significantly less depression, less alcoholism, less drug use amongst that population who uses the ayahuasca than in a non-ayahuasca non population. So that, uh, but I couldn't give you percentages, and I, I, there's never been a study that says, here's a bunch of alcoholics or drug addicts, let's give some of them ayahuasca, let's give some of them a placebo, and what, you know, there's no such studies even theoretically possible. All I can tell you is that in my experience, there have been people who, Cynthia, who will be here one of these nights, would still be living in a hotel if she would still be alive if she hadn't come to one of our ceremonies. And there are people who have healed from sexual addiction, uh, behavior addictions, uh, bulimia, and so on. But there's nothing scientifically that I can tell you that here's the proof. I can't tell you. Well, first of all, I, I need to say that um, it's not for everybody. And we go through uh, a screening process to make sure that people whom it might be inappropriate don't participate. So if you've had psychotic episodes or especially or manic episodes, I don't want you, I don't want to take the responsibility of leading you through a ceremony. I would if I could be with you for the next three months and we look after you afterwards. But there's not that option. So that's the first thing. Uh, you know, you can develop an unhealthy relationship to anything. Nobody's going to get addicted to the substance. I mean, why would anybody get addicted to something that makes you puke and really doesn't make you feel good at all? I mean, there's just nothing attractive about it. You know, and it's not, it's not that you can guarantee that, you know, some people, if they drink, they're going to have a certain predictable experience. Nobody has a predictable experience with ayahuasca. So I don't see any addiction potential there. What can happen for some people, I would believe, is that they stop living their real lives and they start putting all their energies into the having this kind of experience. So there's always that potential. There's always that potential. And there are some people that who wanted to come on my retreat, sometimes repeatedly, and I kind of excluded them. I said, no, you've got to do the work in your own life. Don't rely on this experience to do it for you. So there's that risk, but it's not a huge one. It's, it's, I don't see it as a, a big risk at all, and there's many worse things in this life. So, um, yes, there is that risk with anything, but it's not a significant factor. It's hard to know how far it goes back. There are some uh, ancient carvings that indicate that they, it might have been used maybe even a couple of thousand years ago, but nobody knows for sure. As far as I know, nobody knows for sure. Uh, the original uses would not have been uh, necessarily therapeutic ones. As almost always, plants were used in ceremonial, ritual, uh, spiritual context mm -hmm. to uh, connect people more to creation and to creator, however that was conceived. So, so its original uses would have been more um, in that spiritual, ceremonial sense. And at some point, the shamans began to use it healing, uh, they were, you know, the medicine men, the medicine women, uh, again, not necessarily the individual would take the plant, but the, the shaman would. And then they would guide the other person through whatever they needed to happen. So I think the healing use is probably secondary or, or, or an offshoot, and the original use was probably a spiritual ceremonial. Does everyone need healing in some way? Well, it's not a question of needing. I mean, you can go through life. A lot of people do. They become prime ministers. <laughs> you know? Or presidents. You know, and there's never any healing in their lives, and they may die with honors and have a military funeral with millions of people, you know, watching on television. 
So you can't say that they needed it. Would everyone benefit from it? In this culture, absolutely. There's nobody, not anybody I've ever met or seen on television or read about who wouldn't benefit from some, now that doesn't mean they have to do ayahuasca, but for some kind of a healing process to occur. Uh, healing comes to a word for wholeness. And there are very few whole people uh, in this society. This society does not foster whole people. It fosters broken or alienated or divided people for some of the reasons that PJ actually mentioned and for many other reasons as well. So, so not a, it's not that anybody needs it, but could anybody benefit from it? My answer would be absolutely. 